Okay, thank you again, everyone, for coming out for this important opportunity for you to learn about candidates' positions on issues that are of concern to you. I know we have some, uh, a few additional uh, guests that have come in, so I just will repeat, I guess, our ground rules. Um, our candidates will make their opening statements. They will each have three minutes to do that. Um, and at the conclusion of the debate, each of them will have two minutes to make those closing statements. I will ask questions again that were submitted in advance, and the candidates will answer them in two, two minutes each. Um, I will keep time, and I also want to let the candidates know that there will be a timekeeper there um, that will provide visual cues for you as well. I um, ask that the candidates observe the time limit so that we can address as many uh, topics as possible. And of course, that gives you an opportunity to cover a lot of, of issues and let, uh, let the community members know your position. Um, aside from those questions that were submitted in advance, we will be taking questions from the audience. And I ask that again that all of us remember that this is a civil discourse and an opportunity for us to engage with the candidates and the candidates to uh, engage with each other even um, in a respectful way because we all, we all care about the future of Arlington. And I ask again that we refrain from any personal attacks, interruptions or outbursts, and also personal questions or attacks on the candidates um, won't be allowed. So we can, we can get started then. So we will start with a question that was raised about the criminal justice system. I'm sorry, I'm always eager to get started. <laughs> I apologize for that. Yes. Thank you. 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 Okay, thank you, Carol, for moderating Just Advocacy and the Arlington Schools Hispanic Parents Alliance for hosting. Uh, this is a great event. I'm glad to see it so full. I, uh, I'm running to provide new vision for Arlington's future. That vision includes a more inclusive community for black and Latinx communities, families, and individuals. For many Arlingtonians, we have a great county, but that's not true for everyone, and it should be. We need to work on that. One of the key issues, as I see it, is growing as a whole. Our office vacancy rate is 19.4%. It's hovered at 20% for four years. Equity does worse when the entire community isn't growing. We have to work on that problem. There's also just under 20,000 Arlingtonians who live in poverty, defined as $25,100 for a family of four. I want to share with you my background, talk about where I think we should go as a community, and offer my thoughts on where we need to go over the next four years. My background, I began my career teaching, low-income community where Barbara Jordan grew up. This issue is Equity, fairness, justice, the American dream are very important to me because that's where I started my career. I went on to law school and to serve as an attorney for local governments working on land use and economic development, year, uh, development law. For the last 10 years, I've worked on expanding and strengthening the American dream, Feeding America, Habitat for Humanity. I also worked at the Education Trust on the opportunity and achievement gaps that impact far too many individuals, communities, and students of color and low-income students. I currently work for Native American students as a senior legislative counsel. I also served Arlington, the Housing Commission, the Joint Facilities Advisory Commission, and last year as chair of the School Budget Committee. We closed a $20 million gap last year. We were fiscally responsible, but we also provided teachers a pay raise. I thought that was the right thing to do. So where do we stand? A couple more numbers that give you a sense. We have a $78 million deficit this year. That's 8% of our budget. We have to address that so that we can invest in the things that matter. On our office vacancy rate, we have to grow and attract businesses in, this, in the fields that will prosper so that our entire economy can grow. We also have to make sure we're valuing and addressing the 8% of Arlington that it lives below the poverty line. On our schools, we have to build the schools so we can educate every child. On fairness in the American dream, I believe we should end child hunger in Arlington by 2022. That's a key priority for me. I worked on local economic development as an attorney, so I'm ready to focus on that key issue. I began my career as a teacher, so I'm will willing to make sure we build the schools we need. And I've worked on housing and hunger, so I will be relentless on those issues as well. I look forward to tonight's discussion and ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you very much.
All right. I'm John Bystam. Thanks to Just Advocacy, the Kernodal Farm Firm, and Arlington Schools Hispanics Associate Parent Association for convening this forum tonight. At the outset, I do want to point out that my first job out of law school when I graduated from the University of Nebraska a few decades ago was as a VISTA volunteer for the Nebraska Indian Commission. And from there, I went to become a Legal Services Corporation, a legal aid attorney. Four years ago, you took a chance on me. Against the odds, I leveraged over 30 years of community engagement and leadership to win twice. That experience and perspective over decades allowed me to hit the ground running and to be an effective county board member from the beginning. I believe that Arlingtonians want their local officials to concentrate on the nuts and bolts of local government. They expect their local government to deliver essential community services, programs, and facilities effectively, efficiently, on time, and on budget. I'm keeping my commitments that I pledged four years ago. I can't take full credit, but we're moving away from extravagant and unsustainable capital projects and instead focusing on core services that benefit everyone, like our public schools, metro, bus service, streets and streetlights, parks and open space, public safety, and the social safety net. And with my leadership, we have an independent county auditor and a waste, fraud, and abuse hotline. I greatly admire your grassroots effort and willingness to challenge the status quo. You've asked many tough questions on issues. I've asked tough questions as well. We must embrace Arlington's diversity for every person, including the undocumented. We need a reasonable path to citizenship for everyone. And yes, families belong together. Our Immigrant Services website has improved. We budgeted additional funding for immigrant legal services, and we've raised <coughs> private donations for citizenship classes. I'm pushing for affordable housing opportunities across Arlington, not just on Columbia Pike. As liaison to our Human Rights Commission, we've got to do a better job of having a county workforce that looks more like Arlington and looks more like many of the people in this room. As liaison to our Community Criminal Justice Board, I'm working on issues of particular concern to people of color, including cash bail reform. And as liaison to the Four Mile Run Valley Working Group, I stood up for many businesses that are owned by or employ people who started their lives around the world. I just voted to approve a new privately financed swimming pool in Knock, which when combined with Knock Town Square will really be a game changer for that community. And finally, when it comes to embracing our diversity, it's time for our county boards and commissions to look more like folks here. Bottom line, I value your input, your participation, and your partnership for a better Arlington. And I ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll start with our first question, which concerns the criminal justice system in Arlington. Community members are seeing that a disproportionate number of the people of color are being charged for offenses when compared with their white counterparts. They also cite disparate treatment between community <coughs> members, um, and they see that there are there seem to be more offenses in South Arlington versus North Arlington for similar offenses, such as uh, marijuana procession, for example. So how would you address these disparities in policing and ultimately in our judicial system? And I would ask um, both candidates to please speak slowly because this uh, forum is being translated. And we want to make sure that uh, others who are listening remotely can, can hear. All right, so. Yeah. Well. Do you want me to start? Yes, you we'll start, yes. Start Sure. Um, so I hope you don't mind. I have taken off my jacket to stop 95 degrees right now. <laughs> um, and I will seek to speak a little slower just to help make sure that everyone can, uh, can translate and hear. Um, so this is a challenge that I've worked on a little bit. Um, I want to be mindful um, that we are in a county manager form of government, direct su supervision from the county board to the police chief is not quite the way the system works. There is an oversight role that I see as critical. And uh, I've actually had a couple of conversations through uh, a citizens group with uh, the police chief. And I do think, I've also, I'm also a member of the NAACP. Um, and so I have been part of groups that have tried to speak with the police chief and certainly also the sheriff. We had one conversation uh, as well. There are, there are some statistics that are troubling 
It is also the case that the sheriff and the police chief, they do have implicit bias training as part of the police work. I think that's important and needs to continue. Um, but right now the statistics are out of balance, and so this is something we need to lift up and further address. Um, I think that the police chief um, generally and the police officers seek to do a good job. It is also the case that if we had a police staff that was more reflective of our community, um, both Latino and African American uh, officers, that would, a little more diversity, that would help uh, address some of these challenges. It's a serious issue that I do think there needs to be citizen input on. I don't know that there needs to, we need to think about the structures for that input, um, but it's one I've worked with a number of members of the community on, and I think we need to continue to push forward on that issue, because just saying right now the police chief has said there's disparate uh, out of Arlington individuals who are being stopped, that's, a, that's not answering the question directly. We need to answer the question directly and see if there's actual dis disparate treatment and have citizen input to stop it. Thanks, ma'am. So a couple things. Um, first of all, I am the, uh, each of the county board members, by the way, and there's, as you know, five of us, we each liaise to a basket or a, a collection of various advisory boards and commissions for the county. Um, I am honored uh, to be the liaison to our Community Criminal Justice Board, and our CCJB, as we call it, is the body that is mandated by the state to help coordinate and oversee criminal justice activities in Arlington County. Uh, we meet on a quarterly basis. I would like us to meet more than that. The body is chaired by Paul Ferguson. I'm the county board liaison. We hear on a regular basis from our probation, our parole folks, our judges, our prosecutor participates, our public defender participates, and community members participate. And in fact, uh, as a result of my urging, Kelvin Meneurs, uh, with Arm in Arm, a, a peer group, uh, is a member of CCJB. Uh, we have recruited a number of other folks as well uh, through offender aid and restoration. So I'm deeply committed to working on this. There's no doubt that the statistics are out of whack, and frankly, Arlington's not the only community with that issue. So with respect to statistics, um, I'll, I'll just share one with you right now, and that is that um, our community in Arlington is a, it, it, we have more minorities in our community than we have on our police force. Our police force is doing a better job of diversifying its workforce um, at the higher levels and, and in the rank and file uh, than we have been, same way with our fire department, same way with our sheriff's department, but we need to do better. We are doing a barrier impact analysis right now across the board as to how our county government, including our police, fire, and sheriffs, and our constitutional officers, are going about <coughs> recruiting and retaining and advancing minority employees. And that's a commitment to you um, that I hold dear to do a better job with respect to that. We also get confidential police reports on a regular basis as to incidents of altercations with the police. Um, and they're few and far between, fortunately, but we're keeping an eye on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll take a look at affordable housing. What specific steps do you propose to equally distribute affordable housing throughout the county, uh, more specifically north of Route 50 and uh, north and west of Lee Highway? Okay. Thanks, Carol. So this is a great question. Um, all the way back to when I first ran in 2014, I felt very strongly the fact that we shouldn't be concentrating affordable housing just in certain neighborhoods, just on Columbia Pike, and in particular, the west end of Columbia Pike. All neighborhoods need to embrace affordable housing opportunities for everybody. So what have I done to advance that goal? And by the way, this is very important for our schools as well, because as uh, Dr. Cannon had said, I think we all to varying degrees embrace neighborhood schools, certainly I do, but of course there are historic housing patterns and historic segregation throughout Arlington and, and of course many communities across the country. So number one, um, I'm very happy that the affordable housing master plan that uh, we adopted unanimously back in uh, 2015 has a component in it that says that we are not going to be putting new affordable housing uh, projects in census tracts that are three times or more the poverty rate. I actually wanted to reduce that so that 
it would be a bigger mandate to distribute affordable housing in broader swaths around the county. Number two, we have a we have a ranking system when affordable housing providers come to us and say, okay, we've got our eye on this side or that side. We score them according to very a lot of different metrics: how close they are to transit, what sort of community amenities they're going to providing, and also where the location is. And we score them higher, give them a little bonus boost if they're saying that they're going to be north of Arlington Boulevard or even north of Lee Highway. That's even better. But in, again, I don't think it's strong enough. Um, I'm working with the Virginia Housing Development Authority, VHDA, because they're the ones who allocate tax credits to a lot of the affordable housing projects, including Columbia Hills, just down the pipe. Um, and, but there again, their scoring opportunities are not as high as they should be to diversify affordable housing. I live very close to Lee Highway. I live very close to Westover. I've been a champion of affordable housing in Westover, literally just two blocks from me. Thank you. I think this is a great question. It's um, not an easy question. I'm on the Housing Commission. I was on the Affordable Housing Task Force. I feel very deeply that concentration of poverty has not worked. If you learn anything about the Henry Horner Homes, Chicago projects, those have not been effective. We absolutely need to diversify where affordable housing is. It's, it's going to take courage in order to do that. And it's going to take difficult conversations. One of those conversations has to be at the Lee Highway Alliance to ask for affordable units in the areas along Lee Highway. Um, it also, the Housing Commission's last major project that we looked at, um, the scoring that we have allotted to the affordable housing project led, that we were looking at, led to us choosing to allocate the Affordable Housing Investment Fund into Roslyn, which is a neighborhood that does not have as much affordable housing as we need. So those are steps that we should take. We also should think about affordable housing as home ownership, not just rental. And I think the creative idea to work on that would be the community land trusts that enable homeowners to take half the value of a, a unit and the other half of the value stays with a cooperative housing nonprofit. So those are a couple of different steps. I also think we should acknowledge that we need more affordable housing as a whole. And I'm not talking about necessarily the lowest income tier. We also need, which is below 40 or 50 percent of area median income, but in that middle class, folks that who are working to make their way up into the middle class, we need more units as a whole so that we can stay affordable for everyone. And that's going to be a challenge. That's going to re require resources in addition. But if we have a strong enough system for making sure that there's a preference for dispersion of affordable housing across the entire county, then we will have that dispersion occur. It's going to take persistence, creativity, and it's also going to, we're also going to have to think about zoning changes as a possibility for smaller units that are affordable, but that can be reached. Thanks. Okay. All right, so here is another question about housing. Um, you may recall Richard Rothstein speaking here in the county last spring about the impact of segregation and discriminatory housing practices in the United States. The effect of such actions among people of color include lost opportunities for home ownership and the ability to build wealth as well as transfer it to the next generation. What would be your position on creating a county commission to look at the impact of such policies in Arlington and then crafting solutions to rectify the harm that's done by uh, such policies. So I'd be open to it. Um, I have I was at that forum that Richard Rothstein held, um, and uh, I have purchased his book. Uh, we've had a little campaign, so I haven't finished his book. Um, so that's uh, and, and I want to finish that book before I have a real sense as to whether I think that's the best mechanism. Many of us, many of you in, are involved in the schools, and we want to make sure that the uh, committee that is formed has the best chance to implement solutions. There are folks in the room who've worked at HUD, and boy, listening to Mr. Rothstein, you could hear how policies that may have been well attend intended have absolutely resulted in segregation and disparate impact, which is a real problem. So. We have to think about what's the best way to make sure that the changes that Richard Rothstein suggested get implemented in Arlington, and that's a challenge. So I'd be open to the committee. There are other avenues that we might consider. There's a report out recently called Fulfilling the Promise, 
which is about solutions in Arlington. It's written by about eight or 10 Arlington housing experts. And those experts may have ideas as to implementation. But it's a, the sort of thing that we need to make sure that we're representative of the entire community. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, North Arlington and those closest to courthouse often are overrepresented relative to the county. So in the process of thinking through how to implement this, we need a representative uh, community and we need willingness to follow through. It's in the implementation of policy so often where you don't see uh, true representation by the entire community and true commitment to rectifying the, the, the struggles that we've seen through HUD policy and, every, and, uh, and, and just the private sector through restrictive covenants. So this is something I'd be open to. We need to see the best way to make sure we implement the changes that Mr. Rothstein's <coughs> book raises. So I'm reminded, um, I don't know, Barbara, I can't remember exactly when it was, maybe six months or eight months ago, we had a joint county board school board retreat when we got together uh, and discussed all sorts of issues. It was open to the public. And we had a module on uh, challenging racism. And one of the videos that we saw was really a fascinating uh, black and white video of what the Federal Housing Administration did going back to its founding in the 30s and 1940s, which, which frankly um, ingrained or cemented um, and, and in many cases accelerated housing segregation across the land because of their policies with respect to FHA insured mortgages. In other words, folks in the city couldn't get an FHA insured mortgage, but if you moved to the suburbs and got a new house, boy, could you get a, an FHA insured mortgage just like that. And of course, uh, another um, interesting uh, component there is with, with the way that the federal interstate system was designed, especially in cities. Um, Take a look at the street grids in Arlington, and it's really fascinating. Um, Arlington View, for example, we are building some new market rate and affordable housing uh, in Arlington View, not, not far from Hoffman Boston Elementary School. That street grid does not cut over to Columbia Heights. Look at Knock and think how long a road, Kenmore is, Sherlington Road, and so forth, not well connected to adjacent communities that are much wider. Go up to Halls Hill Highview Park in the Langston community. Same thing. There is actually the remnants of a cement brick wall hearkening back to the era of segregation that literally built a wall <coughs> between a predominantly black community and a, and a prominently white community. So we have a lot to think about in our community, and we can do better. Now, with respect to the exact question, I would just say I'm open to it, but I would encourage the Housing Commission to take it up, maybe in partnership with the Arlington Historical <laughs> Society. Thank you. Thank you. In this next question, a community member cites the changing climate around immigration policy. And they want to know how you keep the community informed about changes in immigration law enforcement. So, I would mention um, a couple things here, and, and um, let me state at the outset that it, it's important that we, we remember that immigration law is, is controlled and orchestrated by the federal government. We don't make immigration law in Arlington. We don't make it in Richmond. They make it over there across the river in that wild and place, crazy place called Washington. Um, notwithstanding that, Arlington County has been crystal clear from day one, going back way before my tenure on the Arlington County Board, that we are going to be a welcoming, embracing, open community for every person who chooses to live in Arlington who comes from the face of this earth. That is the 100% unanimous commitment by our County Board. In January 2017, we reiterated our statement that we had actually made back in 2010 or 2011, addressing uh, the fact that we wanted to continue to be a welcoming and inclusive community in the in the wake of what, or in the wake of the election, um, the county board has beefed up its web page for immigrant services, immigrant services links, policies, programs, and so forth at the federal, state, and local level. It's really kind of a one-stop shop. It's it's a it's really a, a great web page 
for our county. Not all of our pages are that good. Mm -hmm. um, all five of us supported uh, significant additional funding for immigrant legal services. We are facilitating citizenship uh, assistance so that anybody who wants to become a citizen in Arlington, there's enough money now that was donated by the private sector to be able to apply and have their citizenship application paid for. Uh, if you also go to our website, we make very clear, our police do not, are not aiders and abettors of ICE. They enforce the law, and we want our, one of the reasons why we have such a low crime rate in Arlington, frankly, is because there's so much trust between our communities and our police department. And that is because we don't go around asking people for their immigration status. Thank you. So uh, I, I marched and families belonged together along with a number in that march, along with a number of my volu uh, the volunteers and the folks on our team. This is personal and so critical. Um, I would say that we do some things well, but I would see it as less rosy a little bit than what was just described. Um, for example, uh, we to be informed, you need to we need to make sure we are in the community and we're listening in Spanish and other languages to make sure that we're hearing folks' concerns. Um, and that means a regular dialogue. Here's what I've done on the issue. After the 2016 election, which I'll tell you honestly, I did not support this president, and that's not the position of my competitor. He, he didn't vote for any of the four major presidential candidates. I think that's relevant fact. But I did not support this president, and I felt it was critical that we hold a forum. I initiated a community-wide forum that talked about these issues, that brought in lawyers and folks who had personal experience with them, with, with these different communities. And it was an excellent discussion. After that, I chose to push the Democratic Party to pass a resolution to stand strongly against uh, this sort of fear-mongering that this president has been all about. We passed it 14 years ago, the Democratic Party started, started to say, had not passed it. Those are a couple of steps that I've, I've taken. There's still work to do. It is a primarily federal function, but there are ways in which we have moved as a county towards better, less cooperation with ICE, and we need to move towards even less. It is accurate to say that we can't promise that we are a sanctuary city. There's federal law, and that governs how our police deputies and how our sheriffs work. That doesn't mean we couldn't go even further in fighting back against the public charge idea that has just come forward, in fighting back against this idea that at schools, churches, and in other public places, the, uh, the administration has the right to, to check to see uh, folks if folks are available. There's more work to do. We do well, but not perfectly. raises concerning landlord-tenant relationships. They want to know how you will protect the community from landlords that neglect their responsibility for maintenance, for building maintenance, and in other ways try to take advantage of low-income renters. So this is a good and important question. One of the organizations that I respect the most in this area is Bugata, which has done a lot of work uh, in this area. Um, it's also a challenge. I can't promise as a county board member that I would be able to oversee all of this. This is, a, to some extent, it is a staff function, but it takes moral leadership by the, the board to make sure that we are preventing evictions. There is a whole culture. Uh, there is a landlord-tenant commission, which has been working on this, th these issues. But at the Housing Commission, one of these questions came up. At, uh, there was an instance right in Knock, um, at a couple of the projects just off Knox Town Square where there was challenges, AHC wasn't doing as well as it needed to. What we did on the Housing Commission is make sure that AHC and Bugatta and resident representatives came back to us so that some of the issues tried to be addressed. It's still ongoing. That doesn't mean the problem has been fixed, but it takes that regular persistent oversight that I think is going to be key to making sure that we try to address this to the maximum extent possible. There are, we have a finite number of primary uh, developers and property managers, and if you are data focused, you can hold accountable those individual property managers so that they're doing the right steps to make sure that we have the best relationships possible and tenants' needs are getting taken care of. 
I think there's a, a number of folks that I also want to listen to on this issue. And folks that are leaders are uh, Tanya Talento, uh, Christian Dorsey, I'm happy to say he endorsed me today. Um, and uh, I also think there are other, numerous others in the community that I'd want to listen to. To be transparent, one of them that I'd want to hear and, and work through is someone who supported my opponent, Dr. Taylor. He's a leader within the community. I'd want to talk with him as well as others who are civic association president, presidents, Ms. Clark and others. But this is something where that regular dialogue and then the persistence to make sure that we move forward are key. <coughs> Thanks. So it is a multifaceted question. Um, number one, uh, the Affordable Housing Master Plan, again, which we adopted unanimously in 2015, talks a lot about funding affordable housing, affordable housing types, and so forth, but there's an often overlooked component of that affordable housing plan, and that is fair housing, equal housing, and housing quality and code enforcement, specifically building code enforcement. So our building code enforcement people are pretty strict, but frankly, I'm a little disappointed sometimes in their effectiveness and their approach. Now, part of the problem is, you know, you we're all human beings, and, and sometimes personalities can be difficult. Sometimes it's hard to get access into an apartment building. Sometimes folks don't want to give, uh, uh, give our inspectors access even to their own unit that they actually have, have complained about. So it's a challenge. So that's part number one. Part number two is the management companies and the owners of these apartment projects, whether they are private or quasi-public. Um, actually, I got a complaint about a, a, a sanitation issue at an apartment project managed by the Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing, APA, the other day, I gave Carmen Romero a call, and in 24 hours it was taken care of. I've also spoken to Walter Webdale at the Arlington Housing Corporation. These things come up, and sometimes it's just easier to pick up the phone yourself rather than put the complaint through to the county bureaucracy. The Landlord-Tenant Commission is another good resource. They will also look at these types of complaints um, Bill Ross, the former chair of the Landlord-Tenant Commission, is supporting me. Kirit Mukherjee is, a number of other current and former uh, members of the Landlord-Tenant Commission. So we need, to be, we need to be on our game, we need to be vigilant, we need you to be our ears and eyes and deal with uh, code enforcement and, uh, and uh, code enforcement and oversight um, whenever it's an issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I believe now we're going to um, open for questions from the audience. Okay, okay. are there... Just raise your hand. Yes, raise your hand and she will come around with a mic to uh, allow you to ask, ask your question. Good evening, everybody. Um, all right, human rights. Um, the... Uh, Minority student achievement gap is, of course, <coughs> a human rights issue and a human rights failure on the part of the, uh, well, I would say school board and also generally the county. And it's a very serious issue. And uh, uh, talking about human rights, I found out that the county, I understand, Mr. Beast, uh, Mr. Beast, my staff just mentioned that the county has a human rights commission down at the uh, uh, courthouse. And apparently it has jurisdiction throughout the county except the Arlington Public Schools. This, I was told this morning when I called, they said it started in 1993, the Human Rights Commission. That's 25 years ago. And the school board is supposed to have its own Human Rights uh, Commission, but they have refused to have one for the last 25 years, which is sort of, I find it very odd. Um, and the county human rights doesn't have um, jurisdiction over it. Uh, they can if they pass a law. The county board passes a law. Yes. So I would like a commitment from the candidates, if elected or if they retain their seat, they will pass a law so that APS will be also included in the Human Rights Commission, you know, uh, 
uh, Human Rights Commission uh, uh, of Arlington County since they're refusing to have their own Human Rights Commission. Okay, so she would like to hear your position on making the commitment that APS would be included in the Human Rights uh, Commission. Um, so, you know, I, I, I appreciate your sentiment here. Um, one thing that, that we always, uh, you know, that can be sometimes awkward, ma'am, honestly, is all five of us on the county board, we represent the same 250,000 people. Um, you know, we have our own independent um, governing documents, organizational documents, and so forth, and so does the school board. So Barbara Cannon is one of five school board members there, also independently elected. They have their own authority. They have their own jurisdiction. They have their own powers. So um, we would certainly have to, I mean, I'm certainly open to that discussion. Um, you know, I would not, um, frankly, feel that it's appropriate to give you an ironclad pledge right here tonight without either A, talking with my colleagues on the county board, B, collaborating with my colleagues on the school board, C, speaking with the county attorney. Um, people have raised this in the context of other, uh, of other um, commissions as well, but I would point out to you that the Human Rights Commission, I, I would suggest that, that the first opportunity for you to bring an issue like this up would to actually meet with the Human Rights Commission because they may find a way um, if not uh, through some specific provision in their charter, that they may be able to find a way to at least, say, host a community forum or look at the issue without taking action for, you know, for greater sensitivity. That, that could certainly work. Um, the other thing I would just say is that the achievement gap I view as an equity issue. And the county is moving towards looking at everything through an equity lens, which we didn't used to do. The manager has a task force looking at equity uh, now in terms, of, in terms of all our programs. Um, there, is, uh, the, there is a vision 2027, which is looking at equity um, on the healthcare side. We're having a series of conversations now with a nonprofit group, uh, drilling down to look at health, education, transportation, and so forth, all through a lens of equity. So continue the conversation and, and work with us. Thank you. I think it's appropriate not to make a full commitment to you because I would want to learn Virginia law. I'm a lawyer in other states, not in this state. And so, uh, but I'm 80% of the way there. And here's the evidence why if you're concerned about equity, I think you're, I'm your candidate. First, I started my career teaching in a 100% free and reduced lunch community. That is important to me from the start. I'm not claiming I grew up pretty lucky, McLean, there isn't many mean streets in McLean, but I'm an ally and I've spent my life working on this issue. When I moved to Arlington, I got on the Arlington Public Schools Superintendent's Committee on the Achievement Gap. I don't list it in everything because I've got a lot of committees, but it is something I've still been on and I feel that it's not just a school board issue, I think it's a moral issue for our entire community and I think you need county board members who are vested in working on it. If we don't include the Human Rights Commission has done many things and it's been strong in many areas. It also has a rich history of working on LGBT plus rights. But this issue is really important and if, you, if I think about the various committees for the school system, we don't have communities of color, in my view, working together on those commissions. You have the Achievement Gap, which has this rich history on African American achievement issues, um, and you have a committee that's working primarily on Latino and Hispanic issues. And that's not a recipe for the change that I believe we need. And so adding and making the county include the achievement of the APS issues in um, a, the Human Rights Commission, I'm open to that for sure. If it can't happen, there has to be some other way in which I believe the county board takes responsibility for making the American dream real for every child in Arlington and not just the school board's issue. And that's why I'm so glad to have the Arlington Education Association and all five members of the school board supporting me as they know I'll focus on this issue. Uh, just, can I just follow up? May I follow up, please? Well, let's follow up and then we have the next question. I'll just be very quick. Also, in addition um, to the achievement as a human rights, I, I was told um, 
that um, a lot of uh, APS employees go to the Human Rights Commission to be turned away because well, there's no place for them. If they feel they We can't hear you. Oh, hi. Um, and, uh, the additional no. issue is that they, is it working? No. Oh, okay. Also, I was told that um, the um, employees of APS have no place to go. They go to Human Rights Commission. Uh, and they are turned away. They feel they've been unfairly treated or what have you, you know, because there's no place in the county for them to go, go and, you know, and get help, okay. in addition to the student achievement. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I have a question about uh, housing discriminatory practices that if a person has a felony and he applies for housing. It doesn't make any difference how far back the felony was. Uh, they, you can't get housing because of that felony. Uh, a girl was telling me that she had a marijuana charge and she got found not guilty and they wanted her to, to go and get an explanation saying that that would be expunged from her record even though she was found not guilty. Uh, she wasn't able to get housing unless she was able to get that expunged from the record. I would like to know what do you feel about that and if you, if you feel that that's correct or do you feel that <coughs> something should be done about that? Okay, and for those who may not have heard, um, our community member is asking, um, asking our candidates to state their position on um, that policy where people who, have, who may have felonies are being discriminated against um, for housing, and what you would do about that? Sure. So um, the fair, fair, the anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, I think, was a, a, a couple months back. It is a, um, it's a very important issue that I think touches on this question of felonies. I'd have to learn a little bit more about the specifics. I can tell you that I fully support restoration of voting rights. And Governor McCall was absolutely right about that, and it was way too slow in coming. I can also tell you that ban the box should be our policy all the way through. So in employment, you're not being asked that question if it's not relevant. Um, so I think that's a second step. It's also the case um, that we need to work, work to overcome this, but it is true that Virginia law prevents Arlington from taking steps like we're taking in Philadelphia. You may have heard in Philadelphia there was a whole change in the system for what was prosecuted and nonviolent offenses were, um, folks were, were let out on parole if, for nonviolent offenses, it changed the entire city. We don't have that authority in Arlington because we're in Virginia, but we need a change in the legislature to help gain some of that authority so that we can change our policies with respect to, to, to felonies. Um, the other thing that I would say specific to what you just mentioned is I personally believe that small amounts of marijuana should not be criminalized. You should pay a ticket, and that is it. There is so much evidence that the history of disparate uh, criminalization of, of conduct has really been racially charged and led to huge problems in our society. I think that we should stop that as well. Yeah. So, you know, I want to stop applause, but I do want to tell you the last piece is that on housing, I want to be honest enough with you that I've worked for Habitat for Humanity and Rebuilding Together, but there's some more learning that I need to do on that specific policy. I'm sure open to trying to do that. Sure, so our human rights uh, <coughs> ordinance does ban discrimination in the uh, in the sale and the leasing of rental housing. Now, what I'm not sure of is whether or not it also attaches or touches on criminal convictions. Um, that is something that you could take up, or I'm happy, honestly, when I get back back tonight or first thing in the morning, check with our staff about that uh, to, to find out what the situation is. So you might have an avenue through human rights. Uh, you might have an avenue through the Landlord-Tenant Commission. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Certainly, we will have. There are more powers when the housing is federally assisted, so that the the kind of the panoply of what you can and cannot do is much more highly regulated when when there are, say, housing vouchers or federal housing assistance through the through the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, 
Matt mentioned Ban the Box. I am very happy to say that at, in my role uh, as liaison to the Community Criminal Justice Board, we've had a program on Ban the Box. Um, in that body, we have a very strong Ban the Box ordinance. So in other words, you can get your foot in the door without indicating whether you have any sort of criminal record. That is the law in Arlington County for county employees only because we don't have the power to do that for the private sector. Um, also, by the way, on the, on the CCJB, um, we have uh, had a program on, uh, on, on determining support systems for children of incarcerated parents. That is a very big challenge uh, when you have so many uh, young adults and older adults who have kids or who have grandkids who are you know, living in our communities, but yet their parents are locked up. And it's, it's very, very um, heart-wrenching. Uh, so, I, my time is up. Thanks. All right, do we have another question? Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, coming to, to be here with us. Uh, taking uh, Amazon out of the question, even if they come here, and the uh, amount of services that are being created now in the Northern Virginia area, new restaurants, new theaters, and all of that, um, and we look at the uh, housing stock in Arlington. Less than 7% of the housing stock is committed affordable. The majority of the housing stock are either single family homes or town homes or condos. The, the majority of the construction that continues today in Arlington are in single family homes or market rental. How are we gonna house the workers that are going to come for those services if we don't commit more to affordable housing um, when only 7% of that is committed to affordable housing. What is the commitment of the county? We asked, for example, last year, the Social Innovation Lab at Virginia Tech did a study that 43% of the workers <coughs> that come that serve in restaurants in Arlington come from outside Arlington because they cannot afford to live here. So how are we going to house the amount of workers that all these services are, are creating now? Okay. All right, your turn. So, so first of all, w with respect to Amazon, that, that is certainly one of the big question marks. And, and even though your question didn't, relate, didn't directly relate to that, we know what, um, what the move-in of Amazon has done to housing prices in Seattle. Uh, they skyrocketed, and, and frankly, if Amazon comes to Arlington, um, the affordable housing challenge, I think, is going to be exacerbated. Uh, I'm open to it, uh, but in my view, we need to make sure that any agreement that we ink with Amazon um, factors in and helps mitigate the impacts uh, of uh, a new employer of that magnitude on affordable housing, on transportation, and especially our public schools. There's a lot of questions as to you know how many folks even if even if Amazon were to come here, you know where where are these workers going to live? I mean, one of the questions that I ask is when we wooed Nestle from California, Nestle USA, uh, to downtown Roslyn, 750 very high-paying, good jobs. Only about 20% of those Nestle employees actually live in Arlington for various reasons. Um, so that's one statistic to keep in mind. You mentioned committed affordable housing. We also have, of course, marks or market rate affordable housing, and there's thousands more of those units, but they're dwindling every year, not because necessarily they're being bulldozed like they are in Westover, and I just want to add that um, I help lead the county board's initiative to preserve affordable housing in Westover, just a couple blocks from my house. Um, but um, we need to look at various different forms, as well as funding. We need to look at creative forms for affordable housing, accessory dwelling units, um, uh, uh, tiny houses, small houses, uh, duplexes. A board, the board actually just took a major initiative just a, a few weeks ago on our October board meeting where we are facilitating the rehabilitation of single-family homes and duplexes that don't meet our current zoning codes. And by doing that, we're hoping to uh, to uh, disincentivize teardowns and have people reinvest in those modest houses. Thank you. 
So you asked a really hard question, and you could tell that because we talked about Amazon before getting to your question. It was a really hard question. Um, four thoughts. First, Housing Conservation Districts was an ordinance to preserve market rate affordable housing. I testified for it. My opponent voted against it. He viewed property rights as important there. I respect that. I respectfully disagree. I think preserving those units, once they're gone, they're gone forever. Just saving a few next to Westover doesn't touch the thousand, the many, many market rate affordable <coughs> units that are the garden style apartments that one of my volunteers started in before she bought a home and lived her American dream. So that's first, that's a difference. Housing conservation districts, we should do that. Second, this is a place of some agreement. Single family homes, adding density to single family home zoned areas is a hard conversation. That is perhaps one of the hardest conversations we're gonna have to go through over the next four, five, 10 years to get to density. That's something that the board has started a little bit on. We need to continue, <coughs> frankly, uh, whether he'd endorse me or not, Christian Dorsey started that conversation at the Lecky Forum, and that's an important but very difficult conversation. Two other points that I just have to make. First, we need a living wage in Virginia. That requires a change in the legislature, and it requires Arlington being progressive, but not needing to stick it in Richmond's eye. We need to be constructive and progressive, rather than um, just saying we must have a living wage. We need to do it in tiers, but $15 an hour is what we need in order for workforce housing to be possible. The last thing I'd say is, we set a goal in the affordable housing master plan of 600 units per year to try and make it possible so that folks who take care of our kids when they're young, child care workers and teachers and firefighters and police <coughs> officers and folks who serve us food could live here. We're at 280 units, not 600 units a year. I'm not promising you that we can get to 600, but we should either get closer or we should feel the pain as board members of not delivering for you on that key objective. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Michael Webb. Uh, we live in a very divided nation, racially, sexually, uh, but also politically. And uh, I am aware of several instances right here in Arlington where Based upon your ideology, based upon your political parties, there are disparities. In fact, I know of a felon, a Maryland felon, uh, residing in, a, in an apartment here in Arlington who is politically active. Uh, <coughs> the police are aware, the courts are aware, nothing is done. I've seen these disparities in Alexandria and other places in Northern Virginia, and I think that we should be aware that uh, there is political favoritism. And I want to know your uh, thoughts on that. Okay. This is a, not an easy question yeah. again. So um, I guess I'd say that um, I've, been a, I've been a proud Democrat my whole life. I voted for one Republican um, in Austin. And um, I do think that you need to feel it's, uh, it's the results on the issues that are the key. But comedy and getting along is the key. And uh, John and I have had that opportunity. We've done 11 debates or something like that. So if we can get along at this point, then it's not gonna happen. Um, I do think that if you think back to this campaign and the county board race four years ago, we've had a good debate and it's been, there's been disagreements, but it's been civil. And I think at the end of this, everyone's gonna say that we've lifted up the community as a whole. And that I'm really proud of, because I've also articulated strong differences. I'm not just running to get my name out there, I'm running to win. So I think that it's possible to do, have those strong disagreements, um, understand you're not gonna be perfect, and work with the other person. I also do think, I do think it's fair that the Democratic Party has uh, been more open this time than four years ago. I certainly support party primaries and not caucuses where you have to pledge to support someone. I do that because it's the ideas that make me a Democrat, not because I have wonderful people that I love spending time with who are Democrats. So that's kind of my sense of the question. I do think that just saying that balance is better, that's not good enough. It's like saying we need new vision for Arlington's future and then me not telling you what that vision is. Underneath that are the issues. We have to work on housing, the achievement and opportunity gaps. We have to work on 
our parks and our environment and climate change, goodness, climate change. So the issues have to be the focus and test us on that, not just our slogans. Because those are relevant, but that's not the end of the story. So, um, an interesting question, Mr. Webb. So, uh, you know, I uh, I had never hidden the fact that I used to be a Republican. In fact, I was a Republican when I when I ran in 2014, but I ran as an independent to bring people together. I have left the Republican Party. The Republican Party left me. Um, it's very unfortunate. And, and by the way, I'll just mention the man across the river. Um, if you go to my public Facebook posting from June of 2016, I actually spoke out against the man who's now in the White House. I didn't think then, and I certainly don't think now, and my uh, opinion of him has only deteriorated, that not only was he so wrong on so many issues, but he did, does not, did not and does not have the temperament, the demeanor, or the character to be the President of the United States. And I feel even more strongly about that today. Frankly, I thought all four candidates were flawed. I wrote in somebody. Now, switching to, switching to, and if I had thought that, that a Trump might carry Virginia, I probably would have voted for Hillary. Um, but in terms, in terms of, in terms of part, partisanship, I think that partisanship is just way too toxic. If you have a D on, on your forehead or an R on your forehead, you're automatically branded as believing lock, stock, and barrel right down the road. Interestingly, Tim Kaine, when he was running for governor uh, the, the first time, what was it, 2007, 2008, when he was running for governor, now granted it was a little self-serving of him, he said, don't allow one party to have too much control. There are 21 elective offices in Arlington County. There's exactly one of those offices that's held by anybody other than a Democrat, and that is me, the Independent. Terry McAuliffe, three years ago, vetoed legislation put forward by the Republican legislature that would have mandated party identification at the local level for school board and county board. When you walk into that ballot box on Tuesday, it's not going to say an R by my name, or an I, or a D, or a G by my name, or Matt's name. It's nonpartisan. That's the way it should be, and that's the way you should vote. Thank you. Gentlemen, um, with what's going on here in Arlington, Virginia, with the K2 or synthetic marijuana and the pathways that it's coming in here with, in Arlington, Virginia, with the already strained police force, can you share with us some innovative ways that you are looking to uh, address this um, synthetic marijuana? I'm stressing the word synthetic marijuana because it's anything but. So the word marijuana alone is targeting our youth. The effects of, of the drug or one of the drugs that they mix is targeting their mental health, individual mental health challenges. So it's increasing the numbers of overdoses in North Arlington, which means the overdoses in North Arlington are now higher than South Arlington. So what are some innovative ways that you guys have in mind to be able to address this challenge, and especially as far as prevention goes, because now the numbers are so low that we got an opportunity to stamp it out, you know, before it gets out of hand. Thank you. Kelvin, um, I, I can't answer your question directly, frankly. Uh, at the moment, what I can tell you is that um, we have been, we, the county, as you know, um, from being on the, on the criminal justice board with me, we have been very aggressive in terms of fighting opioid addiction. Um, it's a skyrocketing problem. Fortunately, it's not as severe here as it is in many more rural, um, less advantaged communities uh, around the state. Uh, but uh, our opioid task force, which is comprised of 
healthcare professionals, educational professionals, because we're concerned about uh, you know even even kids in high school and, and lower ages. Um, it, it's a it's an interdisciplinary body that is showing results. Um, I attended uh, one of the uh, community uh, discussion groups where we heard from uh, somebody on the staff of Arlington Hospital, I still call it that, Virginia Hospital Center. Uh, and it's, it's heart-wrenching. And you know, now even the realtors are getting involved because the realtors are telling people who have, who have their houses open on a Sunday, get rid of the, you know, lock up your medicine cabinet, hide your pills, don't, you know, take them out of the house so, so people don't, you know, rum, rummage through them. Um, so it's a definite issue. Um, we talk about it all the time. We're putting resources behind it. Uh, drug overdoses have leveled off. So I think we're making progress. Kelvin, you mentioned about mental health. Um, we uh, have added, it was a tough budget year last year, but we've added several health, mental, mental health professionals. Um, the schools have added mental health professionals over the last couple of years and is doing a pretty good job. We're coordinating there. Also, in, in connection with the uh, expansion of Virginia Hospital Center, we are negotiating very aggressively with Virginia Hospital Center to get several pediatric mental health professionals attached to the hospital, either on an Arlington basis or a regional basis. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. You asked a really hard question, so both of us were seeing who's going to get to go first on that one. Um, so, uh, I want to start with mental health. I think that that is critical. That is, people are self-medicating and trying to, children are, are self-medicating and trying to treat themselves with some of these drugs. And mental health expansion is a critical thing, both for children and also to address those as they grow into adulthood. So uh, on the school budget committee, which I chair, um, we did bring down 20 million in costs. We had to present a balanced budget. That's the job of the of the school budget committee chair, but I voted also to make sure that we have psychologists and social workers. And frankly, this is an issue that I've learned from Dr. Cannon and I. She's been very strong. I do think that those social workers and getting down our ratios so that psychologists and social workers can treat students is critical. I think I'm glad that you mentioned and specified that this is in many ways a North Arlington issue. Folks who have a lot of wealth sometimes aren't taking care of their kids and providing that love and care, which is so critical. And so we need to look, regardless of where it is, of what part of the county, we need to be trying to stop this through prevention and mental health. I think that's a key step. Um, I do agree with the point on the crisis response team for the hospital center. I think that's a critical function that we have to have. So those are kind of the, the three big steps that I would say. Um, I also think that we have to work on that transition from school to adulthood for students, some students with disabilities, that can be a challenge and that can lead folks to be in difficult circumstances. Um, I think the last thing I'd have to say is I need to be educated and learn. And certainly I've been lucky, as has John, I've been lucky to go to your arm in arm and uh, shop talk as in, in, the, in the facility, in the, in the barber shop, to continue to learn. And that's something that I'd want to uh, do if I have the honor of serving as well. Okay, that was our last question, and our candidates are going to prepare to make their closing statements. I want to thank all of you for your thoughtful questions, and I appreciate the candidates for carefully considering those questions and sharing their views and their perspectives on them. Uh, we will have we will hear first from uh, Matt Cooper. Thank you, Carol, for moderating, John, for the debate, and each of you for coming tonight. Mi español no es perfecto, pero buenas noches. Gracias para el tiempo. Estaba, era abogado y ahora trabajo para los American Indian students. I look forward to continuing the dialogue. Arlington has many strengths. We have challenges. I mentioned the $78 million deficit. I do think, even with the great subjects that we've talked about, equity does best when we all grow, and more focus on growing economically for all, sustainable economic growth for all is what I think we need. We gotta bring down our office vacancy rate, we have to build the schools we need because large schools with 3,500 or more students don't educate every child. And so those are two things we need to do, and then we need to focus on equity's true meaning. Not equal, 
it means those with the most need should have the most resources. So those are some of the steps I take. On the grip cards that you see and that will be on the exit, you'll see that ending hunger by 2022 is a goal of mine. Last week, our volunteer team went to AFAC to learn and think about how to do that. There's 500 kids who go hungry almost every weekend. We can address that, that's an equity issue. I want to talk a little bit, you'll also see on the way out, I think it's fair, independence is important. It's also true that Tim Kaine and Terry McAuliffe have endorsed my campaign. I know them both well. They support me because they know me, honestly. Terry McAuliffe didn't have to do an event, and Tim Kaine didn't have to say that he was endorsing me. They support me because they know I'll work on equity, housing, education, the issues that are key. I also have the support of Christian Dorsey, <coughs> Vice Chair Tanya Talento, Alfonso Lopez, State Senator Adam Evan, and County Board Chair Katie Crystal. You know these leaders. They think I'm worth trusting. But don't just take their word for it. And don't just take balance is better. Look at my ideas. Go to my website. I'd be honored to earn your vote. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening tonight. I hope I've earned your vote for another term on the county board. I share your commitment to make Arlington County a more just, equitable, and sustainable community with opportunities for everyone. And to listen, engage, learn, and act to get us there. I'm working towards a more just community through my work as board liaison to Arlington Human Rights Commission, as I mentioned, by embracing our immigrant population and working on LGBTQ issues. As liaison to our Community Criminal Justice Board, I've begun the local conversation on cash bail reform. Regarding an equitable Arlington, our county manager has a task force to determine new approaches to everything we do. On sustainability, let's push forward on clean energy and zero waste and protect our parks and green space. We need affordable housing options across the whole of Arlington and economic development that pays as much attention to the small businesses locally owned as the big ones. But there's another reason to vote for me, the balance and conversation that I bring to the board each and every day. It's easy to make too much of political endorsements, you've just heard a raft of them, but three Democratic office holders had the courage to break party ranks and support me this year. Carla De La Pava, Theo Stamos, and my colleague Libby Garvey. In explaining her support for me, former Democratic School Board Chair Sally Baird said, quote, I so appreciate the balance and perspective John represents. His presence ensures a broader dialogue. John at the table affirms the most fundamental of Democratic values, inclusiveness. I hope you agree with Sally that I brought inclusiveness and diversity of ideas to our county board and that we're all the healthier for it. I ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Good night.